is Destiny, and welcome to the Outpourings YouTube channel. I am so excited that you found our channel today, and I pray that the message is life-changing. But before we get to the message, I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us across all social media platforms on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you're ever in the Orlando area, feel free to stop by and pay us a visit. We would love to meet you. With that being said, let's watch today's message. What we have here in, in Revelation 15 is another one of these pictures where, where John is having a vision where things are called back from the past and then bundled up in the present to give us a vision of what's happening in the future. Does that make sense? He's going all the way back. He's saying, this is what, this is what God's been doing all throughout this time that he's been working in this world. And here's how we're, we're seeing it right now, how it's coinciding with all the things that we know to be true. And then here's what he's going to give us on the far end, this beautiful new world. All the sad things come untrue, is what Revelation 21 tells us. All the brokenness of the world, all the tears will be wiped away. There will be no more mourning or crying or sadness or pain, for the old order of things is passing away. And Jesus from the throne saying, Behold, I'm making all things, what, new. Yeah. So Revelation 15 is another picture of this. I named this sermon, The Song of Moses and of the Lamb, because he's, John's asking us to go all the way back to the, the picture of Exodus, to remember that redemptive moment in history and then to pair it with what Jesus is doing as the, as the final sacrificial lamb, right? And then we're going to, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. You're like, that was the intro? Yikes, here we go. Um, we're going to talk about the song of Moses. We're going to talk about the song of the lamb. And then we're going to end with talking about wine. Does that sound fun? Yeah. You guys like wine? I like wine. Okay. Um, so let's begin. Music. What a gift it is, right? What I felt sitting here was uh, an invigorating experience of God bringing his people together to remind us of his story and what he's doing in the world. And, and we can sing the praises of God. We can gather our voices together in one voice to say, this is truly what we believe and how we want to live into the world, right? Music is wonderful. Music is, is, is something that's really hard to kind of quantify or totally understand. It can bring about excitement and joy and, 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 and invigorating, right? And it can also bring about like peace and rest. How many of y'all have kids who have really specific songs they like? Yeah? We have one, it's a song called Sing. Super basic, right? But whenever my kids are really undone, they're, they're screaming, they're crying. We got stuck in the airport the other night for seven hours, didn't get home till three in the morning. It was crazy. Thanks a lot, Windows, or whoever did that. Uh, and <laughs> We're, we're in the car, it's two in the morning, we're trying to get home to get these kids in bed, and my 18-month-old's screaming bloody murder, and we put on the sing song, <laughs> and he's just like, oh, I'm good. And it's like, what? That's amazing. Music has superpowers. I love this stuff. There's another song we listen to called Oh Yeah, and it's a pump-up song. And my son Gus, you know, we're headed home, and he's about to fall asleep for nap time, and you don't want a kid to fall asleep in the car before nap time, right? you got to get them all the way to bed, because if you transfer them, they might wake up. You don't want... You get me? Yeah. <laughs> I get amens from that kind of stuff, right? So he's in the car, and he's just nodding off, nodding off, nodding off. And then we, we click that song, dun, 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 bum, 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 bum. And his little head pops up, and he starts fist bumping like, <laughs> I kid you not. It's the cutest thing in the world, right? Music does this stuff to us. It's, it's incredible, the, the kind of effect that it has on us. And scripture knew this way before we knew this. Did you know there's like 185-odd songs in the Bible? Psalms. Songs from the Old Testament and prophets. There's 14 or 15 alone in Revelation. Every time something wonderful happens in the scriptures, you know what they do? They write a song. They're like, how are we going to get kids to remember this? I know. Let's write a song. Why? Because songs stick with us, right? I, I'm trying to teach my kid all sorts of things about not hitting his brother and whatever else. And you know what he knows? The lyrics to some random 80s you know, rock song that we've played a couple times. I'm like, well, okay. Like Maybe we just teach you in song. Maybe that's, maybe that's the way forward. But the Bible's doing this all the time. It's giving us songs to sing. It's giving us remembrances. It's helping us reach back into the past and say, who was God? And that's where we begin. John, in this vision, says, if you want to understand the song of the Lamb, if you want to understand all that God's doing in Revelation, you cannot forget all that he's done in the past. You have to go back. If, Re Revelation is the most remarkable redemptive story in all of Scripture. Like, it is the best one, right? All evil is being righted in Revelation. But if there was a second best redemption story in Scripture, what do you think it is? The Exodus, right? The people of God have been enslaved for hundreds of years. There's no way out. Pharaoh is as strong as anyone could be. And instead of God raising up an army to come and, and do battle with Pharaoh in that way, you know what he does? He raises up a mediator by the name of Moses. 
And he says, I want you to very simply go to Pharaoh and just tell him, let my people go. That's insane. Why would he do that? The entire workforce of his kingdom. Just, hey, excuse me, sir. Um, I know you've got this thing going on. Could you just let them go? And Pharaoh would be like, oh, sure. <laughs> Great, go for it. Of course not. Pharaoh says, you're crazy. And God says, well, okay, then, then let's play this game. I've, I've got uh, plagues that are not only going to discredit your gods of Egypt, but I also have plagues that are going to bring judgment on your people because of the way that you've been enslaving my people for so long. And what do we get? Ten plagues that represent not only the discrediting of the God. That's a whole other sermon, right? But every one of them is aimed right at an Egyptian God that says, you think your God's strong? Watch this. You think your God's strong? Watch this. And eventually... Pharaoh's firstborn son dies. Do you remember that part of the story? God says you have to kill a lamb and you need his blood on the doorpost in order for your family to be spared. And Pharaoh doesn't believe him. So no lamb and no blood and the firstborn of Egypt is swept away. And so finally Pharaoh says, fine, you can leave. The cost is too high. And then five seconds later, what does he do? <laughs> Wait a second. I need those people. <laughs> And so he comes after them and they, they butt up to the Red Sea, right? And they're terrified because Pharaoh is bearing down on them. And God says, do you think I didn't think about this part, guys? <laughs> like, nothing surprises me. Go ahead and put your staff in the water and it'll part in two. And you will walk on dry land. You will pass through the waters of the first baptism of all time. You will come, you'll be saved through water into dry land. And as Pharaoh's people try to bear down on, on the Israelites, what happens to them? They are crushed by the waters of judgment. And so they get to the far side and they've just experienced the most re miraculous redemption that anyone could have ever witnessed. They were truly dead and have been made alive again. And Moses says, you know what we need to do? <laughs> we have to write a song. <laughs> we've, we've got to sing about this. We, we have to let our children know what God's done because this is unbelievable. No one, would, no one will ever believe us. So let's write a song, and this is what he says from Exodus 15, the song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. Verse 12, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, that your hands have established. He's recounting the past, reminding everyone this is the power and the might of God, and then he's taking a picture and saying, this is what God's going to do in the future. He will lead he will guide. He will welcome us into his place of presence, into his temple. This is the song of Moses. It's a good song. It's a beautiful song. We should sing that one, right? We can put that to music. That's, that's on you. I don't know. who. I don't do that stuff. When I preached this at my church, they were like, why didn't you sing it? And I was like, <laughs> ah, relax. It's above my pay grade. Okay. Song of Moses. John says, look, we, we take that song and we pair it with this song. The new exodus. The new way out of slavery. The song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Friends, we're supposed to put these stories side by side because they're very similar. In, in the book of Exodus, the people are trapped and alone and crying out to God. And here we find ourselves at the end of the story and the people are trapped and alone and crying out for God. In the book of Exodus, Jesus raises a, or God raises up a mediator to send, one who is imperfect and yet by the power and the Spirit of God can be carried along to challenge even the greatest ruler of the day and, and implore him to let God's people go. And how does he do it again in the New Testament? In Jesus, a humble mediator who comes and demands of sin, let my people go. 
In Exodus, we needed a lamb and the blood of the lamb to cover over our doorpost to save us from the impending wrath of God. In the New Testament, we have a new lamb, a perfect, spotless, blemishless man of God, the son of God himself, willing to draw near enough to us incarnate to look us in the eye, invite us into the kingdom, but ultimately to die on the cross so that his blood can be shed and poured out on the doorposts of every one of our hearts saying you will not be drowned in the wrath of God. You can live. It's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb culminating in one space where we are invited into the kingdom of God in and through who? Jesus Christ the great and glorious mediator, the one who was not too great to humble himself to draw near to you and to tell you that he loves you and to give his life for you. It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful story. I'm so glad we sing it so much that we trust in Jesus, that only in Jesus is any of this possible. But there's one more metaphor that I want to tell you about before I'm done for today. And this is where we, get our, uh, the, we pick it up with the idea of wine. Revelation has all of these pictures and all of these stories that are really, really cool. Um, earlier in Revelation, it says that the prayers of God's people are gathered up in golden bowls. And God, God keeps them. What does he do? I don't know what he does with them. Maybe he puts them on a shelf. He's like looking at But think about what, what does that represent? All the cries and the prayers. What are the cries and the prayers of your heart? What was the cry and the prayer of my heart for John Sr. just a few minutes ago? What I want is, is healing and freedom. What I want is for John Sr. to be free of the, the damaging effects of sin in this world. I want healing. I want restoration. So imagine this. God is gathering up the prayers of his people, all the prayers that are for God to right the wrongs in the world and to come against injustice and to free us and to save us and to heal us and all this. Thing. And he bottles all of those up and puts them in these beautiful golden bowls. And then you fast forward in Revelation 15, and what we have here is the, the picture of God's wrath coming to the world. We have a picture of, of God's wrath, and in chapter 14, the, the, the vision that we get of, of creation, how does this wrath, what does it look like? It, it actually looks like wine. In, in chapter 14, it's this wine press, and all of these grapes are being stomped and stomped and stomped, and the, and the wrath of God is poured out, and it's envisioned in this picture of glasses of wine that are going to be drunk by the nations. And so God bundles up all of our prayers and all of the injustices that we're crying out against, right? And he says, do you know what my answer is to all of these bowls that you've filled with your prayers? My holy wrath on the sin and the brokenness of the world. All that you've poured out, I'm going to pour out something different. In all the places where we need justice, I'm going to do it. But he uses this picture of wine. And that's where, again, that's where I want to kind of end today. Wine has been used throughout the scriptures for two, two reasons. It reminds us of the wrath of God all throughout the Old Testament. There's all sorts of uh, pictures in the Psalms and in the, um, in the prophets that talk about God's wrath being pictured as wine. And then it's also used as something for celebration. Right? So we've got these two things that we're trying to hold in tension. The, 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 the sadness, the, the, the gravity, the heaviness of wine as wrath and the joy of wine as celebration. So let me read a couple of these for you. First, we'll talk about the celebration. Psalm 104, 14 and 15. He makes grass grow for the cattle, plants for the people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the human heart, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their heart. He's reminding us that it's, it's a real gift, right? I grew up Baptist, and we weren't allowed to say that. Like, wine wasn't a gift. It was, it was, of, it was of the enemy. Like, any, any alcohol was. Um, but I look at this in, in, in Psalm 104 and then again in John chapter 2 and the wedding at Cana. Do you, did you know this is Jesus' first miracle? He could have picked anything. You can raise people from the dead. You can you know, open people's eyes that have been blind and lame. And what does he choose? The party. <laughs> the celebration. There are plenty of verses against drunkenness, by the way. So if you think I'm trying to condone that, I'm, you're wrong. That's not what I'm trying to condone. But there is something to it that gladdens the heart and helps us go... Uh, draw together in celebration. Jesus goes to this wedding. The people don't have enough money to provide wine for the entire party. The wine has been drunk. Jesus says, bring me these things full of water. And what does he do? He blesses them and they become the best wine anyone's had. 
I think in that story, he's not only blessing the gift of wine, but also the gift of marriage and the joy of celebration, right? So wine is a celebratory thing. We just celebrated the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago. It's, it's the drink of Jesus in terms of what we ought to be remembering him through and the very drink that we will share with him at the wedding supper of the Lamb in the new heavens and new earth. Did you know that? That's the plan. A, 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 a party after a wedding when Christ returns. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see you there. But wine is also pictured as wrath. Psalm 75, 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it to its very dregs. Jeremiah 25. This is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. Take from my hands this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad. Because of the sword, I will send among them. Revelation 14, take your sharp sickle, this is what I just referenced a minute ago, and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine. Because its grapes are ripe, the angel swung its sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. And then finally, Matthew 26. Do you remember Jesus in the garden the night that he was betrayed and killed? Do you remember the prayer that he prayed to his father in the garden? My father, if it's, if it's possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Here's what I want us to see. Well, let me say this first. <laughs> um, sometimes God sets the world up and chooses metaphors for us to have experiences with things that paint a, a small picture of the greater picture, if that makes sense. So, this is not a show of hands question, but... If you have ever drank wine to the dregs, you know what it feels like the next day. If you've ever overserved yourself or been overserved, people like to say that. I got overserved, acting like they didn't do it to themselves, right? <laughs> the physiological effects of too much alcohol destroy your body, <laughs> short term and long term. So God choosing wine as a metaphor and saying this is, this is the, a, a microcosm of what sin looks like because every good gift that God gives is meant to be enjoyed in a, a self-controlled sort of way. You can pick anything. You can pick wine. You can pick money. You can pick power. You can pick any of those things. All of those can be good gifts to you, actually. All of those can be the things that God wants you to have and to enjoy. And the problem with all of those good gifts is turning them into something like an idol and taking too much, wanting too much, squeezing them too tight and saying, give me more. And then what you find is that you get broken in the wake of it. So it's not a surprise to me that God would use something like wine as a picture of wrath because we all know the immediate wrath that wine can wreak on our bodies if we've taken in too much. So that's just a little aside. That was free. You don't have to pay for that one. Um, but as I've stated, there are two pictures of wine in the Bible. It can be of wrath and it can be of celebration. And here's what is so wonderful about Jesus. He knew that the cup of wrath had to be drank to the dregs if you and I were going to know Jesus. And if you and I were going to be reconciled to the Father. It couldn't just be washed away. You couldn't just throw that cup out. The, these golden bowls of wrath have to be drunk by someone. God's wrath has to come against sin. And guess what? You and I are sinners. Did you know that? If Pastor John hasn't told you, sorry about it. Here's the, here's the bad news. You're broken in sin and you need Jesus. So here's the switch. If wine can be both celebration and wrath, 
then which cup should we have to drink? Which cup do you deserve? Apart from Christ, left to your own devices, which cup should you have to put to your lips? It has to be the cup of wrath. It has to be, because that's what you have earned. That is your nature. You are broken. You are sinful. You should have to tip that cup all the way back and drink it down. And do you know what would happen if you did? It'd kill you. And so at the Lord's Supper, when Jesus meets with his best friends in this last night, what he does is he hands them the cup that should have been his. He hands them the cup of celebration. He hands them a cup and says, you get to drink of this over and over and over. And you get to take it in as a gift of God. You get to take it in as something that will fill your souls and remind you of all that I've done, the person and work that I am, the, the, the time on the cross and, the, and the, the time in the grave and then the gift of resurrection and ascension. You get to celebrate. Isn't that what we do at weddings? We, we lift glasses and we toast. We should finish those toasts with the, with, to the king. right? We should finish them and saying, glory be to God that we get to celebrate like we do. But the only way that you get to do that it's because Christ in the garden looked to the Father and said, if this be your will, I'll drink the cup of wrath to the dregs. All these words in the Old Testament, all the words in the prophets and in the Psalms, those were written with Christ taking that wrath cup to his mouth and mind. Think about him on the cross. What do they go and get him as he's in agony up there? They get bitter wine and put it on a sponge and put it to his lips. You can almost feel the tension of it. Him knowing that the bitter taste on his lips is truly the cup of God's wrath that he is drinking for us. I just want you to appreciate it. I want you to appreciate the sacrifice Christ made. I want you to appreciate this story that has been so long in telling, but is culminating in something so simple, some, something so human. <laughs> A celebration, a wedding, a feast. And we all get to partake. Only through humility, only through saying that cup of wrath should be mine. But I trust that Jesus took it for me. And the warning is this. If Christ has not drank your wrath for you, then you will have to drink it. And I don't want that. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for anyone. Because it's a weight that we cannot bear. And thanks be to God, we don't have to. For the Lamb has come. And the Lamb has lived. And the Lamb has died. He has risen from the grave. He's ascended on high and he's coming again. And so we take the elements. <laughs> we lift the bread and we lift the cup and we toast to the king <laughs> because he is our savior. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Hey, I pray that today's message was encouraging to you, and I pray that it was enlightening for you. It's always amazing to hear about the generous character of God, that God gave us the gift of His one and only Son so that we would have life. What do you do when you hear about the gift of God through His Son? I tell you what you do. You respond. We respond to the gift of God. The heart of Christian generosity is responding to the generous character of God. And so, hey, we invite you to come alongside us and live on mission. We do so much in the city of Orlando to be a blessing to those in our community and to help those in need. If you want to participate with us, you can go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, and click on the donate tab, or you can text to give at the number on the screen. We pray that we've been a blessing to you, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.